I come from a family of six children, and I'm the fifth. Six children, I said, and not six girls that we really are. And that's because growing up in my family, gender was never an issue. My father used to tell us all that you can be anything you want to be in life for as long as you set your mind at it and you walk towards it. And that was it for me until I turned 13. When I started becoming socially aware of the gendered nature of society and the violence and the discrimination that women and young girls face. It all started with Papa Dele. Papa Dele was my neighbor. He was an Igbo man, so also was his wife. But I think Papa Dele's mom was Yoruba because all five children they had, four girls and a boy, all had Igbo and Yoruba names. And interestingly, both Papa Dele and Mama Dele were called by the name of the only boy and their last child, Dele. And not the first child, as is usually the case. Now, Papa Dele was involved in an accident and was hospitalized for about three weeks before he died. As soon as Papa Dele died, hell was let loose in his, in his family. His family accused the wife of masterminding the accident that led to his death. They actually said that she was a bad wife all along and accused her of plotting to kill the only boy in order to wipe out the name of their brother. So as soon as the funeral was over, they forcefully took this little boy and sent her and the four girls out. Then my auntie, my dad's sister, beautiful woman, my dad loved her so much. You know men and sisters and daughters. And then she got, actually got married from her compound. But barely six months into the marriage, she kept running back home. I remember vividly the final one that made me see so much anger on my father's face. I've never seen it before. When she came back with torn clothes, bloodshot eyes, bleeding, nose, I mean her nose bleeding, and some scratches on her body. Yet another fight. Of course, all the times that other times she ran back when my parents gave her shelter. They'll send for the man, and he'll come with the Bible, and he would say, it is the devil. But on that last one, my parents said no. And then I went on to the university, and I had a roommate who, was, who had a boyfriend, also an undergraduate, always excited to go out on a date with this guy, but most times coming back very sad and teary. And then years later, when I started work, there was this case of a man, a Nigerian man married to a Filipino woman who had three girls. And he was actually sexually abusing the eldest girl, who was 12 at the time. This girl tried running a couple of times. Unfortunately for her, he would catch her and he would tell her, if you succeed in getting away, then know that you are responsible for me moving down to your junior sister was seven at the time. Violence against women and young girls is one of the most pervasive and endemic forms of human rights violation the world over. It can be physical in nature, sexual, and psychological. And in this our climb, it includes harmful traditional practices, male child preference, female genital mutilation, widowhood rights. Around the world, one in three women, representing about 30%, have been, uh, one in three women, representing 30%, have been abused, coerced into sex, and beaten. In Nigeria, the Gender in Nigeria report, 2012, showed that one out of five women young girls between the ages of 15 to 24 have experienced one form of violence or the other. And for us at Project Alert, in a report we released early this year titled Sexual Violence in Nigeria, a Silent Epidemic, we analyzed 1,110 cases reported at the Mirabel Center. The Mirabel Center happens to be the first sexual assault referral center in the country. When we analyzed those 1,110 cases, 
it came out that 70% of the victims are babies, toddlers, and infants ages 0 to 17 years. Four months old babies, six years old, five years old. Violence against women and young girls knows no boundary. We shouldn't fool ourselves. It cuts across age. It cuts across ethnicity, religion, educational status, and social backgrounds. Interestingly, as against men, women and young girls are more at risk of violence from people they know, people they love, and people they trust. The impunity that comes with violence against women is so huge. And that's why most times when people say victims don't speak out, the question is when they speak out, what happens? Culture, tradition, religion combined together further aids the perpetration of different forms of violence against women and young girls. Women in marriages are told to pray for their abusers. Just keep praying for him. They are told divorce is a no, no, no. And the question is between the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage, which comes first? A dead woman is not a wife, just like a dead man too would not be a husband. Culture and cultural practices. Several women have died in the search for the proverbial male child. When the doctors, your, 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 your medical practitioners have told you, don't come back again, madam. After this two, after this three, don't come back again. But the fear of not having a male child sends them back repeatedly, and some have gone that way. You talk of widowhood rights and practices, just like Papa Dele. I tell people that no married Nigerian man dies a natural death. It's only the unmarried ones that die natural death. Even if his plane fell from the sky, his wife killed him. Even if she was carrying him all around, he was down with cancer, and everybody knows that for years she's been moving around with him. She killed him. And of course, like Papa Dele, who had an accident, the wife killed him. So what do we do? Are all men violent? No. My husband is right here. My father was never violent. And that was why I was shocked when I turned 13 and started seeing these things happening as I grew up. So what is the missing link? The anti-violence campaign has been, advocacy has been going on for so long. But at this point, we need to build an important bridge. And what is that bridge? Working with men and boys. Violence is a learned conduct, and as such, it can be unlearned. You know, when you're talking to men, if you want to get a man's undivided attention on the issue of violence against women, talk about daughters, talk about sisters, talk about mothers. Forget about girlfriends and wives. Yes, those are game. So talk about daughters, talk about sisters, Talk about mothers. We go into schools. When we go into schools and we're talking to boys, and then you tell a young man, a young boy there, how would you feel when you get back home? If you get back home and as you open the door and say, hi, mommy, I'm back. And then you see three men raping her. It's, it's, un, it's totally unimaginable. Are you a father? The father to that young girl walking down the shopping mall with the daughter and then... One guy passes and brushes her butt or says something crazy. The men here, how would you respond to that? Would you find that funny? I don't think so. We need to engage men as mentors, as role models. It's not all men that are abusive. We need to give a voice to the men to the boys, who need, they all need a platform to stand on and join us in speaking out 
against violence against women. It's the right thing to do. It's the right way to go. And as such, I'd like to wrap up by saying, ending violence against women begins with men. And as such, we must engage men, we must engage boys as our sons, as our brothers, as our fathers, in order to make sure that there's zero tolerance for all forms of violence against women and young girls. Thank you very much.